let's get going. Um, so my name is Michael Case, and I work with Kiara Consulting. We're a, um, a small consulting group that operate out of six different time zones. We've got 11 people. Um, we primarily deal with um, C++ type code, but we're full stack, so everything from small, very, very, very small embedded things to um, product that gets shipped around, robotic type things, industrial control things, to large uh, distributed servers. Um, and our team deals a lot with C++, mostly with C++, but we sometimes do some other things too. Um, it ends up that we do a lot with networking. And uh, so networking is, is interesting to me, and uh, hopefully it'll be interesting to you, which is why you're here. So networking, three easy steps. Every good C++ community has a Rust individual. Um, how, many of you are, how many of you are on Slack inside of the, the okay, so you already know Nicole. Nicole um, loves Rust. She would just like C++ to be as good as Rust. Pretty, pretty common statement from Rust users. But you know what, what gets me about Rust users is they're all so nice about it. And so normally you might call them trolls, except for Nicole's clearly not a troll. I mean, she's like, She's very intelligent and smart, and she knows both languages really well. So they're kind of like more like evangelists. So for her, this slide, three easy steps, just use Rust. And we could be done with networking completely. We wouldn't have to do anything else. So first, step one, make a cappuccino. Step number two, write two lines of code. And then step number three, of course, you got to mock all of your C++ fellow people on social media. So once you've completed those three, um, you're done, right? So those would be the three easy steps if we were to do this in Rust. Um, but it just ends up that we can actually do three easy steps in C++. So we're going to make a cappuccino, and we're going to write a few lines of code, and then we're just going to smile at the Rust people because we're going to be really polite. <laughs> All right. So here we go. More than two lines of code, but there are a few. And they're, they're pretty simple. They fit on a slide, small slide. Um, we're going to include some stuff. And uh, we're going to open up an I.O. stream that um, is through a TCP socket to a particular location, boost.org. We're going to send some information so we can do an HTTP request. And then uh, we're going to process the stream coming back just like a plain old normal stream. There we go. We just, uh, we just got the home page from boost.org with this. Not too bad. So there we go. We're as good as every other language. So um, I've got to, I've got to confess a little bit here. Uh, th these are just three of the failures of my life. I picked the Atari Mega ST because that seemed like the thing to do. Um, the the week after I bought my Next, they stopped making Next. <laughs> So I promptly switched to the IBM RS6000 Power PC based, uh, which the following year was discontinued because uh, nobody wanted to use that platform anymore either. So um, it's not really good for me with picking stuff. I picked, I picked the Palm Pilot when it was US Robotics, the very, very, very first version out. And that actually, that was like my success right there. I kind of thought, maybe it's over, the bad luck stuff. But as you can see, not completely. So when I gave this talk in 2010, um, actually just across over there, about ASIO, I kind of thought maybe it was doomed. Um, and that's when I introduced the whole idea of slushies and talking about proactors. And I thought, you know, that's probably the end of ASIO. They'll probably just like get kicked out of Boost. Who would have thought that it would have like been the thing that started the movement for the networking TS. So luckily, my bad luck has not rubbed off. And so if you are familiar with Boost ASIO, you are largely familiar with what's inside of the networking TS. How many of you are Boost ASIO users? Good number of you. All right, great. So um, it, is, uh, it is based upon, the networking, T networking TS is based upon the work by uh, Chris Koloff. And, um, ASIO entered into Boost in 2008. Um, in 2017, March, so just in March, the fifth draft of the networking TS was published. Um, and uh, the, uh, there are a number of things. How many of you have actually looked at the TS? 
Okay. Uh, so there are a lot of things in the TS that we are not going to talk about. Executors is one of them. Yet, at the same time, executors are like required for this whole thing to work. Um, there's enough contention about executors that now there is a unified executor group, and they're, um, they're on teleconference every other week discussing it, and hopefully at some point, maybe, you know, 2023, Bryce tells me, they'll come up with an idea of what that should be. Um, so this standalone ASIO is uh, very much like the TS. So if you have not used the Boost ASIO, but you use the standalone version, very much like that. Um, and Chris has a snapshot of that with all the names changed, which we'll be using inside this workshop. And that is, um, that's got the names changed so that it matches what's inside of the networking TS. <clears throat> so what's included? Uh, if you're familiar with ASIO, then uh, you might be expecting a lot of different things. Serial port support, uh, file systems, all kinds of different things, right? ASIO, that's ASIO. Inside the networking TS, it deals with two things, TCP and UDP for the, for the um, networking protocols. Um, it deals with client and server applications, how to deal with scalability, deals with, um, with protocols that are both v4 and v6, it has name resolution in it, timers, and buffer management, of course. So those are the things that are in it. What's not in it? All of that other stuff that you may have already been familiar with in the past, higher level protocols. So ASIO, it, excuse me, um, networking TS is a lower level thing. On top of it, you will build other functionality. You would build, for example, Beast is built on top of Boost ASIO and will be converted over to the networking TS. Beast is for dealing with, um, with um, something that I just forgot. Whew. What's that? Hey, yeah, WebSockets. Boy, I won't admit that I'm actually the review manager for it. It's really sad. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll get fired. All right, it's not gonna deal with your uh, QoS enabled sockets, um, real-time environments, other IO type things. So it, it is much more focused, the network, networking TS is much more focused than ASIO was. Um, but if you've done one, you'll, you'll be very familiar then with the other. So let's get started with stream. So we saw this basic stream usage. Um, you know, this is really the claim to fame for so many of the other languages is that you can quickly get something up and going and you could pull some information over if you needed to. And we're able to do that with streams. Uh, what are some of the problems with this slide? Okay, there's no error handling. What, what are we going to do about errors? In fact, um, you know, most of these languages, when you start dealing with them, they don't care about, about errors either, right? So uh, this, is a, this is a great slide in order to get it condensed down. We don't have to worry about errors. So errors are one of the things that, that are missing. Anything else that might be missing off of here that you might be concerned with? Okay, no SSL. There's no SSL inside of the networking TS. How about, um, you know, we're kind of we're missing um, timeout things. What, what happens if this is just like hangs forever? Does it just like hang forever? Um, do we deal with just what the system level is or do we have to be able to, you know, what if you want it to only try to wait for 10 seconds to get that, that, that name resolved? So um, we can actually add in a few things with the stream. So first of all, you'll see that we've got um, an expires after five seconds. So we can actually set up for the stream that actions that are occurring have some expiration that will, will be for the timeout. So we can set that up. Eh, that, gets a, that gets us a little bit. And then we actually can treat the stream just like we would any other stream. We can test it. So we can test S, the stream, to see if it returns false. If it returns false, then we can ask for what is the error. So there's a little bit of functionality that can get us some things. Um, Okay, so what do you think error should return? Okay. Unknown protocol? Okay. Anything else? What, what's the type? Standard error code. Standard error code, okay, yeah. So um, standard error code is a great thing to be able to return. It ends up that the error code, standard error code, comes out of boost error, system error codes. And those were developed by Beeman and Chris. Uh, Beeman is the author of the uh, Boost file system, which is the file system for 
uh, the standard um, or based upon that. And Chris, of course, for, um, for the networking. Both are problems that have to deal with this. I've got an error that's a system strange error down below. It's platform specific. And I now need to represent something up to some piece of code higher up in a way that that higher up piece of code can deal with it by not really having to know like the individual POSIX error for this platform. Is there a way to abstract that up yet at the same time not lose the error information? Because the error information that was thrown up by the, the system is important. And I might need to know that, that level of detail. I might need to make decisions at my program level based upon generic ideas and concepts of what the error was. But um, I need to be able to maintain what really occurred coming up from the system. So error code, error code will do that for us. And um, networking TS is built on top of error code. So we're going to see error code showing up a lot. Um, so it's going to capture that platform specific error. It's going to hold this pointer to this error category that's going to help us understand at a high level what, what the error means. Um, OK, so the stream interface, it basically satisfies time to, to, to hello world, which is like the, that's the buy decision that so many people use, right? I, I have an Arduino. Why? Because it was super easy to get up and going. I was like, okay, what are you gonna do with it now? <laughs> you know, so they're, they're like these decisions that people make based upon does it fit on a slide? All right, so we have it, it fit on a slide. How many people are excited about networking based upon using strings? Nobody in this room. Why? Because we're all C developers and we want to like pick at everything, right? We want complete control, so it drives us nuts. And then once we have complete control, we want to complain about how difficult it is to use the library because of all this control that we have. OK, so um, we'll eventually get there. So let's talk about synchronous. So um, I actually wrote this slide seven years ago. My daughters were younger then. Seven years younger, in fact. Daughter number one, I would say, hey, please make me a coffee. And she'd say, sure, dad. And, you know, time would pass. She would go off, make a cappuccino. I could hear the machine, frothy milk in the background. It was wonderful. And then eventually she would show up with the cup of coffee and hand it to me and here's your coffee. And I say, thank you. This was an asynchronous transaction. I got to continue working at my desk and doing things while the coffee was being made. This was awesome. Daughter number three. Daughter number three would say, I'd say, please make me a coffee. She'd love to make coffee. Okay, but when she was 10, uh, it didn't always go so well. So we would both get up and go to the coffee machine. And I would supervise, right? I'd just hang out and watch to make sure that, you know, nothing weird got inside of my coffee, that the machine was going to survive the experience. <laughs> and we would go back together to the desk, and then she'd say, hey, here's your coffee. And I'd say, thank you. All right. That is a synchronous transaction. I had to wait around for the thing to occur. And it has a lot of downsides, but you know what? That, that story illustrated a, an upside too, which is if I needed to like finally tune and control and watch something, I could do that in a synchronous nature. If I just like sent somebody off to do something and I'm off doing something else and then I come back to get it, yeah, you know, hopefully it came back fine. So, when should synchronous I.O. be used? Or think about it this way, when is it used? When have you seen it used? When the consumer is slower than the producer. Okay, the consumer is slower than the producer. Okay, absolutely. Because then you don't know. Everything's instantaneous, right? It just showed up. Wow, I asked for it, it's here. Any other times? In version 1.0. In, in version 1.0, yes. So you, you hit a really good point. Very often in version 1.0, we write synchronous code because it's easy, right? We just want to get it to work. And, and a lot of us think in, in terms of procedural operations, do this, and then next I want to do this, and then next I want to do that. And as soon as things get inverted, then we're like, eh, I don't know what that is. Um, so we're gonna start off with the easy, the first version, synchronous. Um, sometimes we, uh, we use it because the default version of timeouts is fine. What the system wants to do, eh, it's okay with me. 
It's that simple program, the, v, the V0, the first version, V1. Um, sometimes we need finer grain control that we can get um, with higher level libraries. We need to be able to mess around with like IO control crud. We need to like fine tune every single bit that's coming across. Um, last week, I wrote an SPI bit binging routine, right? Uh, I'm gonna sit around synchronously doing something, you know, binging bits because uh, I don't have anything better to do at the moment, right? So that's what, that's what that routine's going to do. All right, uh, this is an eye chart, it's okay. It'll be bigger in a moment. So here's our same example of fetching that website, um, but in synchronous. So if we just look at the flow, what we're going to do first is some, some setup of some things. We're gonna get this thing called an IO context. We're gonna get a socket, a resolver, so we can figure out what the address is. And then uh, we're gonna connect. And then after that, we're going to send out the request, the HTTP request, so that we can get the response that we want for the web page. We're going to read the header in. And then after we read the header in, we're gonna read the body in. So the same type of routine that was going on previously with the slides. And then we're just gonna print it out. All right, that's the order of activities that we wanna perform. So um, let's start with this. Uh, first line there, we're going to create an IO context. All right, if you have, if you have used uh, AZO, this is like an IO service. Think of it that way at the moment, okay? So in your mind, you can just kinda of think of it as this is the IO service, I'm gonna create that. Uh, the IO context is provided to each of the networking objects. So every object that we're going to create, we're going to pass that in. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the, uh, the IO context, but we're gonna wait until we get to asynchronous mode to talk more about it. So right now, we're just gonna be passing this thing in. All right, socket and resolver. Notice that they have um, TCP as what appears to be like the namespace. It's actually um, declared inside of the the, um, the standard as being a class and then within, or to, to look like a class and within it, we have the socket and we have the resolver. So these will give us a socket and a resolver that are associated with TCP type communications. Um, there's also UDP. So if we wanted a UDP socket, we could get one of those. So a TCP socket is really just a basic stream socket TCP. This looks a lot like the types of things that we've seen inside of ASIO. The UDP socket is a basic datagram socket of type UDP. So now I have a socket and a resolver. Um, the resolver is a way to get from a host name and, um, and a service name into an endpoint or vice versa. I have an endpoint and I want to understand what the host name and the service name is for that. So I can go either direction once I have a resolver. The resolver is going to then provide, um, when we give it the host name and the service name, the resolver is going to provide the endpoint. And the endpoint is what we want to associate the socket with, right? So that we can do some communication. So uh, connect is what I'm going to use for that. Connect will connect a socket and an endpoint. And the resolver is going to return an endpoint, so I can say resolver, resolve, boost org, HTTP, and this is going then to do the name lookup, figure out the endpoint, pass that endpoint off to connect, along with the socket, and we'll get the connection. Yeah. Is it gonna resolve the IPv6 address or the IPv4 address? Okay, so the question is, is this going to resolve the IPv4 or the V6? Uh, this one, I believe the way it's currently written, will resolve which other, which either the, it's going to resolve. Um, and, the, and the return result is going to be an iterator um, of all the different ones. So we're gonna get, we're gonna get a list that we can choose from. Um, the way we're utilizing it, it's gonna choose the first one. Okay. So uh, where is the error handling in this? Good, yeah, does it throw exceptions? And then I, I, like, I like the way you said it too, because it's kind of like, I really don't know sure that I want it to throw an exception. Is it gonna throw exceptions? Uh, yeah, it's gonna throw an exception. So uh, synchronous functions have one of two signatures. 
they either look like this first one that doesn't have an error code, or they look like the second one in which the last parameter is an error code, a reference to an error code. So sometimes bad things at the system level are exceptional, and you want to treat them as exceptional. Sometimes they're just a matter of routine. In fact, a lot of communication type stuff is just a matter of routine, right? Hey, look, I couldn't resolve the name again, right? So you don't want to be throwing exceptions all the time. This is not Java, so we don't use exceptions for flow control, right? We, uh, we would want the error code and then make a determination based upon the error code what's going to occur after that. So all synchronous functions have these two variations. One in which there is no error code, that one will throw the exception. One in which there is an error code, and then that will go ahead and, um, and provide the exception for us, returns void. Um, it's going to throw an exception that matches the type of the system error. So that's what we're going to get back out if an exception is thrown. All right, so we've set up some rules about error handling. Oh, no, we've got a couple more. Oh, yeah. So... Uh, this version is going to set the error code appropriately on the error, and if you test it for not error, so EC, not EC, is true, then there was no error, all right? So we just Boolean test the return result, um, excuse me, the, um, the object, and if it is uh, not an error, then it will test um, that it's not an error. All right, so connect. We've now connected. If we didn't connect, there was a problem, we would have thrown in an exception here. Um, all right, so here's the right, and um, you'll see that in a, in a number of these slides, they're not necessarily good practices. They're just showing you variations of ways to abuse the library at any particular time. Um, here, you wouldn't necessarily uh, iterate over a bunch of strings in order to send the header out, but you know, we could. And so um, we're going to iterate over and write to the socket, so net colon colon write. We're going to write to the socket the buffer. And um, this is just like we have seen in ASIO, this is going to be the key into sending stuff out and bringing stuff in, buffers. So right away when we look at this, what can we say about error handling for this call? It throws. it throws an exception, right. So bad things happen at the system level, it will throw an exception. Okay, so buffers. Let's talk a little bit about buffers. They're central to getting data moved around inside of networking. Um, all of our I.O. is going to be performed through buffers. There's a variety of different types. And uh, just like in ASIO, you, um, you continue to own the segment of memory. The buffer is a view. It's a view to something that you're not going to destroy. You're not going to let it go out of scope. You're not going to do all the bad things that you might think of doing, thinking that suddenly the buffer is owning the thing that you pass to it. Okay. So there are three types. There are mutable buffers, constant buffers, and a dynamic buffer. And the easiest way to get a buffer is just to use one of the creation op operations. So there are a, um, a variety of them, and um, these functions will let us um, pass something in and their proxies. Out of that, we're going to then get the appropriate type of buffer. So mutable buffers. Well, how can we get mutable buffers? Well, we could, we could just pass it some void star to something or another and the number of bytes that we want. All of our C friends will love us. Um, we can create them out of mutable buffers. We can create them out of, um, of um, a variety of different array-looking things, vectors, strings, more array-looking things. So mutable buffers are going to be the, the thing that allows us to write into, right? Makes sense. These are buffer sequences. So it could be a sequence of buffers that we're going to get. The same thing occurs for the const side. So we are writing, we just need a const buffer. And so we'll use a const buffer. Again, same types of things that we can get. Um, now on this side, we can have a string view. 
So the addition to the const side from the mutable is that string views can be passed in. And we can therefore get um, a buffer from that. Uh, dynamic buffer creation. So dynamic buffer creation, these are, these are pretty neat. Um, it allows us to provide something like a vector or a string. And the result is a buffer that can change in size. And it looks a lot like the streaming I.O. type buffering that you may have written long ago, um, where it's dealing with trying to get the next memory segment that it's going to utilize. It commits it so that it can be used for the read side. The read side is consuming it, right? So we've got consumes. So that's what under the hood it looks like. But the cool part is we can just like give it a vector and it'll continue to resize the vector to whatever it needs or a string. The versions that take a size, um, that size tells it the max size that the buffer can grow to. So we're not going to consume all of memory. We're only going to consume most of memory. All right, so we have our write. Um, this net buffer is that, that uh, function that's going to return our buffer for us. And then we had um, this delimited read. So we're, we're trying to read the headers. And in a HTTP response, the headers basically, each header line is uh, delimited by um, carriage return new line. And uh, then once there's a blank one of those, you're done with headers. And now you can move on to the body. So that's just the protocol and how, how it speaks. So what we're looking for is basically a series of these things tagged together with each other. And, and when they are, then, hey, we're at the end, um, and, and we can continue on. This falls apart if there were no headers, by the way. Just thought I'd mention that. <laughs> right, well, there's that, too. We're going to, so um, you, you can catch me on the next slide. Um, so this is going to read until the delimiter is contained inside of the buffer. That's its job. So it's going to read until, here's the socket that it's reading from. It's using a dynamic buffer to put the information into. It's this string, right? It's going into this string. And it's looking for this sequence. A delimiter can either be a char or a string view. Those are the two types of things that we can pass to it for what the delimiter is. And um, how are errors being handled? Yes. I do just a quick question. Is there an or in your question? Read until this delimiter is reached or? In a moment. Okay. Yes. <laughs> how are errors ha handled inside of this? Exceptions. OK, so an exception will be thrown. How much memory will be consumed? Yeah, so if this is running on the network somewhere, like with the wild world, or in your test group, depending upon how nice your test group is, it's just gonna like blow up the machine, right? So we probably should cap this, we didn't. What would I do if I wanted to cap this? If that was the, yeah, so I could just add in dynamic buffer, header, comma, and then some capped mount, right? And just like, after that, I don't really care about headers anymore. Uh, you know, there are smarter ways to do networking than that, but there we go. We could cap it. Um, okay, so we have a read. Uh, what's this read doing? How's it working? Okay, perhaps till the connection's closed. Yeah, it's going to read until some error or something, right? And, and we're not throwing an exception this time. We passed it an error code. So it will fill the error code. Um, let's run it. This is where everything falls apart because I didn't set it up ahead of time. It's all good. Oops. OK. 
Can nobody see that? Hmm, bigger. Yeah, that's me. I want bigger. Okay, are we able to see that or not so much? Not so much. All right, compile it. All right, so we ran it and at the end we could see that um, that error condition is in the file. So we read until we got an into file. Um, let's, uh, let, let's change this just for a moment. And um, let's not print out the body. Oh my goodness. All right, so how's this look for headers? It seems something. Yeah, okay, it shouldn't have this body. Yeah, yeah, Gore, Gore was kind of leading us on here a little earlier. Um, it's in the buffer. So we have the headers, they're definitely here. And here's this end of header bit. But man, we've got a bunch of other junk that we didn't necessarily want. And why? Well, because the condition for completion was when this thing is seen inside of the buffer, right? And it was seen inside the buffer. There happened to be some other things in the buffer also. So um, yeah, that's, that's too bad. So what, uh, what's the alternative? What, what kinds of things can we deal with here? You may think of anything that we do to fix this. Yep. Yeah, so we could just pull in buffers and split it ourselves, right? So we're just like efficiently reading whatever do you have available network, reading that in and splitting it. Okay, that would be sad to be efficient right away. So let's not do that yet. Um, Let's replace our read until with a read and providing it this thing called a completion condition. So read until, um, read until is basically the same type of idea, but this condition is very special. We're gonna actually say, we're going to give it a read. We want you to read from the socket into this buffer uh, and uh, I'm going to tell you what the condition is in which to evaluate. So how does this thing work? The completion condition is called prior to each read sum. So under the hood, there are all these read sums occurring. Read sum, read sum, read sum, read sum. And uh, the, the signature looks like it's going to pass the error code and the total size that's been read so far in the operation. Not for that read sum or the previous read sum, but total for this read. Okay, whatever the accumulated is. And it's going to return something. Well, what it returns is, it returns the number of bytes you would like the read sum to read this next time around. So before read sum is called, we could then evaluate the buffer, what do we have? And we can then tell it how many bytes to read, right? So if we were like, um, oh, so, so this will continue, this read continues to transfer bytes until one of these things are true. There's an error, okay, there's an error, it's gonna stop. If the completion code condition, excuse me, the completion condition returns a zero, it will stop. Or if um, the buffer size of buffers has been transferred. So we're dealing with a dynamic buffer that we haven't capped, so that's not gonna happen. We could end either because we have an error or we can end at the moment because 
the completion code has returned zero. Don't read any more bytes, please. All right, so let's be completely inefficient. Let's do this one byte at a time. So I could say, here is going to be my completion condition in which I look to see, hey, if there's an error code, then I want to stop. Um, or if uh, the size that I've read so far is greater than three and the last four bytes look like the thing I'm looking for, then I don't want to read any more. Otherwise, read the next one in. Okay, completely inefficient. But, you know, it would get the job done, right? So this is how a completion condition works. It allows us to provide these predicates that say, evaluate something or another before I do read sum again, and then tell me how many bytes do you want to read in this read sum that's coming up. So it gives us some fine control of it. Um, we'll run out of time, so we won't do the demo. It, it works. <laughs> It'll be on the thumb drive you get if you stay for the second session. All right, let's talk about asynchronous. All right, we're gonna talk just briefly now about uh, our I.O. context. So our I.O. context is what's called an execution context. And this points to this thing called an executor. And the executor contains all the rules in which to abide by for when, when um, function objects are queued to be worked on. So, if something's queuing a bunch of function objects, please run these functions for me. Well, what are the rules which you want me to run them? Do you want these things ran on a GPU? Do you want these things all ran at one time? Do you want these things run with some priority? How do you want them, how do you want them to be ran? Do you want them so that they're only ever ran sequentially for certain categories of things? There are a lot of different ways that you may want to run something, right? And the idea of executors is to give you control of that. We have one more slide about ex executors, and then I don't want to talk about them again. But if you want to talk about them, Bryce would love to talk to you about them in the bar, I am certain. <laughs> we were at it for about 45 minutes yesterday. So, All right, uh, I.O. context is the thing that we're dealing with. And the I.O. context is going to point to the system executor. It's a type of executor, okay? And the system executor says, eh, however many threads I run, I'm just going to run stuff and they can all run concurrently, right? So if I have five threads, and I've got five things queued up, they're all running. If I have five threads, and I have seven things queued up, two things are hanging out and waiting. And as soon as the first thread that's available can run it, it will. That's what the system executor looks like. Okay. Um, Let's do some live coding because there's nothing more scary than that. Be a default font big. Can you see that? Or a little bit bigger? All right. Huge. Too close. Too close. <laughs> hmm. well, it's clearly not at the beginning of the buffer because <laughs> I can't see the top of the buffer. <laughs> oh. Fine, there, all right. <sighs> so, uh, just a side point. The best thing I ever did was get a Mac last year. <laughs> because all the previous years with my Linux machines that I'd bring, it was always my fault that something didn't work. And last year the projectors didn't work either. But no longer was it my fault because I had a Mac. I'm just saying. <laughs> Max. Shifting blame. Okay. So uh, let's take a look at this I.O. context. I have an I.O. context. I want to post some work. I just, hey, 
go do some work for me. Uh, okay, so um, post, I tell it the, the IO context that I want to post to, and this, the context is the um, execution context, which will then point to an executor that tells it the rules in which you can, you can obey of how, how you're going to run things. And um, you know, here's some null array thing, high C++ now, 2017. Um, and let's go ahead and, and do something with that. Hmm, but not that, boy. Hmm, the plural guy. All right, it printed nothing. Not very useful. So I was hoping it would maybe print something out, but it doesn't. Why doesn't it? Yeah, my, my main thread just, it just exited, yeah. So um, that was kind of anticlimactic. It's not going to help me that way. Um, so what is it, for those of you who've used ASIO before, what is it that I need to do? Yeah, I, I need to call run. So uh, this IO context has a run method on it, and if I want to supply a thread to it to be utilized, then um, I need to call run. And so for every time I call run, I will get uh, one more thread that can execute things that are posted. And so now, uh, let's go ahead and uh, we'll add that run there. Let's sleep for two seconds. Let's post something. Um, we'll join our thread and then we'll exit. Sound good? Okay. All right, sleeping. Still. Oh, thread joined. Okay, sleeping and thread joined. What's going on? Maybe I, should, maybe I just run it again. No, oh no, this one, this one definitely didn't pass. How many, how many of you, just wondering, how many of you have these like, oh yeah, no, that, that test just sometimes fails. <laughs> Look, I, I really don't get that, okay? You should always run that one at least three times. Yeah. Here's my confession. I'm a double E. I understand why sometimes our stuff sometimes fails, right? But when I'm writing software, I, I don't know. Not just to write it off. Hell yeah, that one sometimes fails. That's weird. Okay, so why, why does this thing not do what I want? Any thoughts? Does run keep running? Or does it just run and see if there's nothing to do and then stop? Ooh. Does run keep running or does it just like run and then like nothing to do and it just stops? So we, we call run on the IO context. So this is an execution context. We call run on it. Its job is to look and see, hey, what do I have to do? And as long as it has something to do, that thread of execution will continue working on things. But as soon as there's nothing left to do, it just ends. So the question is, why didn't I just call run down here below the post? And that, the reason I didn't is because it would not have shown this problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, but more commonly what happens is, is we, we have a series of threads that we want to use for executing I.O., right? I'm gonna dedicate a thread or two threads for this thing. And, and so I dedicate those couple threads and now I go set up my I.O. and um, nothing happens. Nothing happens because the thread started running and there was no work to do and they said, okay, well, I'm done. And they just ended. So 
yeah, I can move the sleep around. I could do, I, I could give it a chance, and then sometimes it runs, and sometimes it fails, and I'm just like, whatever, that's a shrug. Oh, Gwen has an idea. Why not we see if there's a work something or another? And uh, yeah, there is. So we can create a work guard. And as long as the work guard object exists, then um, this work guard object will keep the thing alive. It appears that there's still work to do. All right, there's no work to do. But it appears that there's still work to do, and the thread will, um, will not just end. So we can now control the lifetime of this work object in a variety of different ways, right? There's all kinds of stuff that we can do. We can now control it, and so as a result, we can control um, whether or not this thing's gonna go, um, w when we want things to end. So now, let's go ahead and see how we're doing. Oh, did we add any other code? Or is nothing else interesting? Nothing else is interesting. So same exact code. Uh, we've got the thread joining at the top here, and it joined at the bottom, so we just know whether we joined or not. Now is it going to hang? All right, so we slept, uh, and uh, yeah, thread joining, we're kind of, we're stuck. What's the processor load of that thread? Oh. It's really small, and you can't see it. <laughs> it's it's very small. It's not it's not on there at all. See, okay. Yeah, it, it's not doing anything, right? It has nothing to do. It's just waiting on something. Yeah. The, so the question was about the the load. Um, all right. So so what are we going to do now? How are we going to get out of this situation where you know the program hangs, the QA people are mad, they can't shut it down, they can't get their donuts. It's awful. What's that? Add braces. Add braces. All right. Let's add some braces. We'll make the work object just go out of scope. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. So we could, there, there are lots of ways to control the lifetime of the work object, right? If we can make the work object go away when we want to, then we can actually clean everything up. So moral of the story, control the work object the way you want to. Release it when you're done. Hey, you release the work object and there's still work in the queue. Awesome, because the queue will continue to finish that work, right? So um, work objects are good. Um, all right, let's add another thread because one thread's boring. And we're going to now post um, something to be printed out, and we're going to post another thing to be printed out. Each of them are going to sleep for one second. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to name anything. No. Uh, so what are we? You can name the threads in the second session. It's a good idea. So what, what are we going to expect from this? Well, hopefully they're not interleaved, okay? So they possibly could be interleaved. Why, why might they be interleaved? Okay, so we might have some fun with C out. Okay, so look, hey, they weren't, they weren't interleaved. We saw both of them at the same time. They're both executing on separate threads. That's pretty cool, right? Well, eventually if we run it, they'll probably get all whacked up, right? They'll just like be ah, confused. We don't have time for that though. So um, it's possible that they can get confused at some point. Uh, what, is that a problem? <laughs> okay, so it, it could be a problem depending upon the thing that you are um, that you're executing, right? So some things don't care. Some things are reentrant. They uh, we could we could do this all day long, right? Hmm, that is we're having really major issues here. Like, oh, no, this is give me my other machine back. Um, okay, so for this particular execution context, for this particular executor, all the threads are just running and whatever's inside the queue is gonna get a thread if one's available. And, and for some objects, that isn't cool. Can you think of anything in I.O. that that's not gonna work so well for? Yeah, 
runs over a, a port to something else. Yeah, sending commands, and, and we've got like maybe two different threads trying to send commands, and they're both now trying to send on the same serialized stream of bits that are going out, and they're interleaving their data. That's bad, right? There, there are all kinds of places where um, we need to sometimes control um, that ability. And um, And we're going to get there. But first, since we're not going to do a discussion about slushies today and pro actors, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you should watch the video that has the pro actor slushy story in it so you know all the downfalls of pro actors and the good sides. Um, what's going on is when we call async something or another, we are calling what's called an initiating function. Async anything that we're gonna talk about moving forward is an initiating function. It is going to start this asynchronous whatever we want. As an example, it's going to start for the post. It's going to be a initiating function. And the, the thing that we wanna start, that operation is outstanding. It's sitting around waiting for a resource to be able to take and do something with it. From that point, it's going to move into this place where we can observe side effects. It's gonna run, right? And the completion handler, because it's going to finish, is going to get submitted to the executor. So I've done whatever you wanted. When we're posting something, I've done whatever you wanted is like just take the completion handler and run it. Um, and then that's going to move into this operation completed. So the operation completed, the completion handler has not been run yet. The last stage is call the completion handler. All right, so we've got, you can kind of see that we almost have like these two different queues that are they're separating these things, right? Now, we're, we're gonna come back and revisit this, this diagram a couple times. Um, Let's take a look at our little problem that we've got with, uh, with things stomping on each other. So what we can use is something called a strand. And the strand is just the same as the strand that you may have seen in ASIO. Um, we're going to create this strand. And it is created based upon the type the executor is. We can actually get that type back out of the, um, the context by asking for the type. We pass to it the executor also that we want to use. So again, from the context, we would say get executor. And then we've got our same kind of work guard and whatnot. And this time when we're posting, instead of posting directly um, in using the context, we're going to post using the strand. And the strand is going to guarantee some things for us. The strand is going to guarantee that two function objects associated with the same strand will not be running at the same time. Another guarantee that's inside of the networking TS that's not inside of ASIO is that there's a guarantee of order. So as things are given to the strand, they will be executed in that same order. So if you give something to the strand and then you give another thing to the strand, it's like this serialization queue. You can kind of think of it that way, right? You've got the serialization queue of work that's going to be getting done one after another, but never at the same time. So that works really well if you have writes, for example. You queue up all the different writes that you need to do using a strand. They'll just then happen, serialized in the order that you wanted them to, as opposed to all at the same time. Right, well, we couldn't actually get it to fail, so it will be no, it'll look exactly the same when it doesn't fail as when it did fail. Um, let's add in a timer. So, um, there's this thing called a steady timer. So we create a timer and we pass it the context again. It's this execution context that we need constantly that helps give the rules in which these asynchronous events can occur in, or asynchronous activities can run in. Um, so we've now got this timer, and 
um, we can tell the timer things like it's going to expire after two seconds. So after two seconds, this timer will expire. And then say async wait, and then do something, right? Give it a handle. What do you want it to do? So uh, expires after two seconds. Is that when the two seconds begins? Or async wait, is that when it begins? Ooh. When expires after. Expires after. Is that good? Yeah, it's the only thing that would make sense, right? So um, expires after is when we want, when we want to have this. Um, we're saying this timer is going to expire after a certain amount of time. It might be like 20 seconds before I decide that I actually want to, to, to async wait on it, right? Well, that's okay. But it's going to expire at this point. I won't, I won't get it when I want it. Now, how many of you have ever done this before? Uh, ignore the sleep for one second there, but we can have another. In fact, let's actually just let's comment this out. This will be fun, really. So we have this async wait here, uh, and then on the same timer we have another async wait. Can we do that? What's going to happen? This is. Are you guys dizzy yet? Because I am. I've lost my screen. Yeah, that's a great idea. As soon as we find the one, we'll put them next to each other. Is it this one? Uh, so, uh, can you repeat the comment? Because I can't repeat the comment because I didn't actually hear it. <laughs> Mm. So they didn't call it when or then. Um, yeah, that's true. They, they're not chained together. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why. Um, but let's let's take a look and see what the semantics are. Hmm. Put um. Okay, there you go. There was your, your, your data corruption. They wrote over each other. You excited? You happy? <laughs> timer handle one and timer handle two. They just like clobbered each other. Okay, so timer handle one and timer handle two, they're, they're printing out. They both came at the exact same time when the timer expired after that two seconds. Both of them have been notified. That's kind of interesting. In fact, we could keep adding um, and all, all of them will go off when the timer expires for however many threats. Right, so that's kind of a weird thing. Let's uh, let's do this while well, we're in the middle of. Oops, we're going that way now. <sighs> let's we set this thing up, and now let's go ahead and just like we set up a timer. We said we're going to wait for two seconds, right? And um, we gave it a handler. Now let's go ahead and say, oh, you know what? Really, actually, oh, I don't want to wait that long. I want to wait some another amount of time. I want to expire after one second and then set up another handler. So at this point in time, the first timer hasn't expired yet. There's a handler associated with it, but the timer hasn't expired yet. We're using timers because they're easy right now, but the same rules are going to apply to all of our asynchronous stuff we're going to deal with. So I changed the behavior. What's going to happen? Okay, so um, you just like, just kind of like change your mind and add it in the middle. Oh, I see, because it's not going to be observable. You set the timer for two seconds, you wait one second, and you reset it for one second. Yeah. It's going to go off after one second. So it's going to go after one second. And, but how about the first, the, the first handler that we set up? So we set it for two seconds, we set a handler to that. And then we're later, we we're like, eh, I actually really want it one second. Here's a different handler. What do you think, Gore? I'm sure that error code you have as one operator might come up with answers. 
I think you might be right. <laughs> All right, so um, what we're going to see here is uh, we have a jumbled mess again on the screen. However, timer handle uh, one, and on the very next line you see that one in front of the high, that was its error code is reporting back, there was an error code. And it came right away. I don't know if you probably didn't notice that, but we didn't have to wait for that. It's like, bam, it's there, error code. Oh, and then now the timer went off. Why? Well, because uh, we had a handler waiting on a very specific timer, right? And now we just went and changed the timer. So the, the handler is going to get called with an error. It's not waiting on that timer anymore. That timer has been canceled in essence. So if you change the time on a timer, the effect is that the timer has been canceled and a new timer is in effect. And if you cancel a timer, anytime you cancel a timer or any other asynchronous IO type thing, when you cancel it, all of the completion handlers will get called with an error code. It's not that they're just gonna not get called. They always get called and they're gonna get called with errors so you can handle them appropriately, which is really nice. Whew, that, that is a projector that's working hard. It's funny is because that's my personal projector and I've never heard it do that before, so it's angry. All right, one last thing then. So, expires after two seconds and we're going to have our async wait. And then um, here's another async wait. And then look at what I can do. I can call cancel one. And what cancel one is going to do is it's going to cancel the very first handler that's been set up, the one that's at the top. I can keep cancel calling cancel one, right, until there aren't any, but cancel one is going to to cancel the first one. Is that the guarantee it will cancel the first? Yes, the first one that has been called will, will get canceled. For the wait. No, canceled means it's gonna get called with an error code. We always get error codes. And so the takeaway that I want you to take from this is that if you set up a completion handler to do something, it's gonna get called. If you said, hey, close the socket, start shutting things down, I'm done with all of this, right? And at the same time, all of your objects that were like set up for handling the completion handlers that you don't think are important anymore because you've just closed everything down, go out of scope, that's bad. So a lot of the ASIO code that we fix as a company for other clients is because they do just that. They start closing things and shutting stuff down and they think, eh, I don't need my completion handlers anymore that I've registered. Yes, you do, because they're gonna get called with error codes. So that's not the way to clean up nicely, right? You want to actually clean things up with inside of your completion handlers. They're gonna get called. Look at the error code, do something with it that's appropriate. There are a variety of questions. Gwen, did you have one? No. Yeah. Oh, okay. Gore. What is the motivation for cancel one? I have no idea. Do you have an idea? Come on, Gore. <laughs> All right, no, I, I don't have an idea. Do, do you have an idea? I have no idea. No, we now have questions. Okay, let's. So, it, so there's no way to just like async on wait, like async wait or the data handler and like, I'm actually like not run that handler. You want to remove the handler. So, you know, um, so I, I would actually argue the, the opposite. You're writing extra code by trying to remove things out that you don't want to work anymore. And you have race conditions that you have to deal with. So you have to try to figure all these things out or something has to, right? As opposed to just shutting things down and letting the handlers deal with the error codes appropriately. Because you're gonna have to, you should, you better, be writing your error codes to handle proper problems anyhow. And, and the actual handler getting canceled, that's just a normal thing of life. And, and so I would make the argument, you don't want mechanisms to remove stuff back out of the queue. 
You want to be able to maybe cancel asynchronous activities and then let those things deal with the, the reactions from that, but I don't think you want to remove them. That's a really good question. So what happens when a handler throws an exception? When a handler throws an exception, um, it is up to the executor of what occurs. Um, and so the, uh, the one that we're dealing with, the system executor, will, will do something really nice and call system terminate for you because that's, that's really nice. So don't let them leak out. You mean it doesn't act like a package task? It doesn't act like a package task or a feature derived command. So, you know, you can always just put everything in a package task. I don't know why. Just if you just don't let your, don't let them leak out. Don't do that. Don't let them leak. Okay. So, question on the, on the cancel. So, the cancel. Yes. Probably go back to the code that you used to reference. Code. So, you took away the, the first, uh, I shouldn't say the first, you took away the, uh, the resetting of the timer when you switched to the cancel one, right? Yes. Okay. So, literally, the, the error that's occurring, or the error condition that's occurring, in, in that first turn, yeah, this one right here. It's not because you reset the timer; it's because of the cancel. It's because of the cancel. Okay. Yeah. Before there was an error code, so the, the error code that's here is because we've canceled. The error code previously was because we changed the timer, and there was a handler waiting for that original timer. Mm -hmm. So basically, anytime you do any simply, or sorry, anytime you, that you stick something onto the, the queue, essentially should anticipate that you're going to get an error code and, and process it. Ne never write one of these without assuming that there's going to be an error code change. Yes. <laughs> I think it creates very good behavior. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Kirk? Yeah, so I have a need for a timer and a scram. That's both. But I can't compose these two fits. So I need to be able to make it FIFO, I need to be able to scram, uh, which I can do, but I need it to be FIFO at time t. If I put in three things in order with the same time, and of course I would have to use three different timers for that, right? For, I would want them to fire in the order that I created them. I understand what you're saying. Do you shift and transform? Um, <laughs> I need that. <laughs> you're gonna be here for the next, the next part? We'll work on that. All right, any other questions before we move? Yes, away from time. See, who would have thought timers were so fascinating? <laughs> Building on that one, yeah, when you, when you ran this and the output got introduced, yeah. before the solution that the Julia thing was, you call a scram with each call. Uh, and you can't, can you do that with async loads? Yeah, so um, can, can anybody guess where we might deal with this problem with the async wait? No, no. <laughs> I'm not repeating that. <laughs> so every time that we deal with some asynchronous object thing, we pass to it what, what um, in essence, the executor looks like. What are the rules of engagement? And so if I had passed a strand into my timers instead, the same strand into my timers, then it would make sure that um, that those completion handlers are not running at the same time. Yeah, Gores. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Hmm. Okay, yeah, so um, you are right. Yes, okay. Yes. So, thank you. The um, Gore, who's the resident expert in here to correct me at my every mistake, though has not, by the way, because I've made a couple, I think, um, <laughs> um, is pointing out that, okay, the IO context, um, this is an execution context. An execution context points to an executor. A strand is an executor. It is not an execution context. 
And so we're passing execution context into timer. What we would have to do is, is wrap our completion handler with the strand. Um, and there is actually, in the second half we can do this, there is a way to do this. There's a helper function that will actually do this where you pass it in the, um, the completion handler or the thing that you want, the completion token. You pass the completion token and you tell it to compose it with the executor, which executor you want it to use. What is the name of that function? We'll do it in the second half. <laughs> it's about that long, actually. It is. Uh. All right. Okay, so I am going to blow past this really fast for a lot of different reasons, though I can tell we already have some future lovers inside of this room. The first thing we had to do at the top was include future. And as soon as you include future, you've got a problem because the future doesn't exist. And it ends up that unfortunately, while this code, as I'm pretty certain, is exactly right, it actually will not compile with, uh, with the dynamic buffers. If we make these instead mutable buffers, it will compile fine. But um, the move semantics in the library are not correct, it appears, for the dynamic one. So it's just like a bug. But, uh, this is how you would do this asynchronously if you wanted to use futures. Okay, so um, we've got the thread and I've got my resolver again. And here when I say resolve, I'm gonna resolve asynchronously the, um, the address, I'm going to pass it a token, the completion token. So we've been passing it functions and now we're just gonna, func um, we're gonna pass it instead this token that says use future. And the return is now a future of the type that is not the error, but whatever the other argument is inside of the completion handler that would have been called, whatever that, that type was, that's what the type is of the future that's being returned. So we've got this resolve, um, and here now I'm going to call resolve get, and this, you know, in theory you're doing work here, right? And this now will block until it gets the result, and um, again I pass it the future, so now I've got the same thing with the connect, and I can keep doing this where I'm getting futures of the return value back, of which then if there was an error, what would happen? Is there actually there? Uh, yeah, what? Well, yeah, so I get the exception in get that would have been passed back up, right? And so that exception would be um, the exception that's based upon the system error that would have been the, the result, the error code half. What was the question? Auto header read, you meant use future, not user future? <laughs> Auto header. Just get up and show me there, buddy. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hey, maybe that's why it doesn't compile. <laughs> Just kidding. It's not that. <laughs> All right. So, look, um, I think this is very unsatisfying. Uh, even if we could chain these things together, I think it's very unsatisfying. I think. Personally, I think um, composing complex things in order to get complex work, just at some point you start falling apart, right? I've got this thing, and then, and then do this, and then do, it's like, that's a disaster in my mind. But um, if you want to know more about my, my personal opinion, Thomas Heller and I are going to have it out where he's going to talk about futures, and I'm going to do some other different way that's going to be cooler than his at Meaning C++. Don't really know that yet because we haven't had our talks accepted, but I'm sure it's gonna be great. Oh yeah, you want to talk about futures? Because I don't really want to talk about them. I was gonna say, is there an implicit, uh, is there an implicit wait for connections? It's like we're calling async connect, and then, then we're calling async send on the socket. You have this variable connect, which do I use? Is that, is, are we implicitly waiting for a connection? Oh shoot, no, that's an error. See, and then it would have ran. <laughs> a disaster yeah so we should have like we should have called a get at some point on the connect to make sure we were connected before we did the send that would have been good <laughs> no we're not really using futures that we're calling get every other line and definitely abusing the future the <laughs> Um, but we would somewhere we in theory do stuff. I don't know. It's just like it's it's putting this stuff together in some sensible way. 
um, for like real communication, I think is going to be actually fairly complicated, I, I think. Yes. I, I'm curious to know why we said that even if you had the ability to say dot then and, uh, and chain them together, why is that not good? Because um, it's really, it's like my time to hello world. For very simple problems, it works great. So but as soon as the problem becomes, like has any complexity at all, then you have, um, you have these futures that are making weird logical choices in order to do thens and do what? Um, Just with a slide, you'd be all the way off. The it, way it's off. a disaster. I, I'm happy to talk about it over the break, because, yes? Can you call it again iocontext.run, but I don't see the work watcher object? Calling iocontext.run, but you don't see the... The, the, uh, the object keeping the thread alive? So oh. There's no, there's no work guard. There's no work guard. There's no yeah, there's no work guard. Can we move on? I don't want to talk about the future. Obviously, you compile incrementally. The future is bad. Oh my goodness. Let's talk about this instead. Um, so, uh, let's talk about let's talk about old school. How many? First of all, how many of you are scared about um, like inversion control stuff? It's just like it frightens you and it makes you scared. Okay. At the break, Gore has amazing things with coroutines. It solves all kinds of problems. It's true, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but we're not going to do it that way. So um, we are going to solve the same example that we've been solving of getting web pages with this little thing called the web page getter. And we're going to pass it. Um, an I, the I.O. context, and we're going to call get page, and we're going to get a future from this and then use the future. So in theory, we could have done some other work, and then when we needed the result, we could have then done, done something with that result. So let's see how we would put this together. Um, this all looks the same, right? We've, we've seen this type of thing before where in, in the main where we've been creating the, the stuff that we need, the I.O. context and a thread. Um, <coughs> Okay, what's this web getter thing? Well, the web getter, we can construct it by passing in a reference to the I.O. context and call it get page. And inside of it, um, it's going to have a reference to the I.O. context, a socket, the header, the body, and the promise that we're going to um, notify once we have everything that we want. Um, we've got some helpers here, this connect, Read header, read body, and then send request. I, hopefully the names make sense. Maybe everything but the web getter thing. All right, remember this thing. Our initiating function gets our function so that it's outstanding. Eventually it's going to run. And then once it's completed, then our completion handler is going to show up here. And then it's going to get called. All right? So we can construct them, and when we call get page, um, we're going to go ahead and set up a new promise, socket, header, and body. Um, so we're getting a new promise because we're going to use the one that we potentially had in a previous call. Um, and the header and the body, we're going to move out later, so we need new ones to play with. And then we're gonna call connect and we're going to return the future from the promise. So far, so good? All right. So what does connect look like? Here is the resolver, and we're going to call async connect, passing it the resolver, and then what do we want done when it's complete? Okay, here's our completion um, handler. So we have the error code, and then the endpoint happens to be the other thing that's passed in. We're not going to use it. We're just going to check to see if there was no error. If there's no error, we're going to send the request and we're going to read the header. Those are the two things we need to do, right? We need to send the request to get the web page and then we want to read the header, start reading the header in. Um, otherwise, if there was a problem, we're just going to call set exception with whatever our error code is that came in on the promise. Okay, we're going to call it good. You're going to ask a question later, I could tell. That'll work. 
What is send request? Send request does nothing more than ac calls async send, passing it um, our request information. And um, I don't actually really care about the completion handler here. I'm just going to assume it works. So there we go. It sent the stuff. Because what we really want to look at is what the read header, header looks like. So read header is going to read until. We've seen this already, this read until thing, but now this is the async version. So async read until, um, passing it to the socket. We have the buffer. This is what we want to read until. And now we've got the error code and the number of bytes that have been transferred. As long as we don't have an error, we're going to read the body. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and set the exception for whatever the error code is that we got. What are we going to do for reading the body? So for reading the body, we are going to transfer all. So we're basically saying, just continue reading until there's nothing left to read. Grab everything. And for our completion handler, if there's no error, and it's not, um, or the error code is in file, because that's, that's actually not really an error in our condition, right? That actually means we've got everything that we wanted. So if there is no error or the error code is uh, in file, then we want to go ahead and set the promise value um, for this tuple with the header and the body. Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and set an exception. Um, and then I'm going to call socket close. All right, how does all of this work? What, what's the idea here? What are we trying to, what, what are we trying to describe? Yeah, in essence, we're trying to describe a state machine, right? We're basically saying that I want you asynchronously to do this thing. And when that thing is done, then I want you to call this completion thing, which is going to hopefully start off another thing, right? And so forth. Um, in fact, the way that we actually use um, the asynchronous library bits inside of Kiera is we almost always pair them up with state machines. So this is nothing more than the thing that feeds the events to the state machine that really has the real logic and work of, of things getting done. Um, ends up that people like the medical industry really like if you implement things in state machines because it <laughs> typically means that you didn't miss any of the stuff you weren't supposed to miss. Um, all right, look, don't go crazy after seeing this slide. I don't know if you guys can read that. Maybe it's good you can't. It ends up that YouTube video is like in the middle of one of my talks. So I <laughs> decided that I should probably respond to it like the month after I saw it on there. I need to be on Reddit more often, I guess. Um, so you can't have both, at least I don't think you can have both, super fine control of stuff and time to hello world streams. If you want time to hello world streams, you got them now. And if you want to control things, you've got finer level controls, lots of which we haven't covered at all. Um, one of the things that drove this guy nuts was this. Let's say you're writing a chat server. I'm sorry, yes, you're writing a chat server. So you've got clients connecting in. Lots of clients connecting in. Every time a client connects in, it gets handed off to some object that represents that client. And so as more and more clients come in, we get more of these. Who owns the client handler? Who owns that object? Like the lifetime of that object? Pardon me, a callback? Okay, a callback? So in some companies, what owns that is the client handler manager. Look, my very first manager in work when I got out of college mistakenly said in the middle of a, a code review, look, managers aren't supposed to do any work. You're like, yeah. <laughs> Get out of here. So um, 
a lot of people solve this by saying, oh, I've got this little thing and I'm going to stick it on a queue and every once in a while or in a list and every once in a while I'm going to like go through the list and I'm going to reap the, the objects that aren't like running anymore. I'm going to check, are you still around? Are you still around? Are you still around? Don't do that. Okay, the thing that owns the client handler is whether or not the client handler has any more work to do. It owns itself via the connection on the other side. If it still has more work to do, it needs to stay alive. If it doesn't have any more work to do, it should go away. And the only thing that actually knows that is itself. And so the common pattern of solving this is enabled shared from this. There are other patterns to do this, okay? This is just like the simplest one. You inherit from enabled shared from this, and then each time you have a completion handler, you take a reference to yourself, which is a shared pointer, and stick it inside of the completion handler. And then that goes out there, sits around on the queue, right? It's going to maintain your life. As long as you are waiting for something to get done, your object will stay alive. And as soon as all of that falls apart, your object will clean up. Magical lifetime management. It's all okay, it's good. So let me, we're almost out of time for the first half here. What's that? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, how do you, how do you tell clients you want to shut down? Um, I'll get back to you in the break. Well, are you going to be here for the second half? Let's we'll solve it. Excellent. All right. Um, so uh, think about uh, layered designs. So this is a low-level communication thing. There's probably higher level things that you're going to do on top of it and maybe above that. You probably want to think about when you got work in, you're not going to do all your work on your communication thread. That's dealing with communication. You might hand that off to some other like thread pool or something that is taking care of like doing computations and whatnot. Um, think about maybe combining this with the meta state machine or spirit or whatnot. Um, that's we actually have, within Kira, we have like these generic little bits. Like we just, we grab this little thing, we pass to it the grammar and the endpoint type that we want, and out of it comes objects that just show up places, right? These are like really common patterns that all of us solve all the time. I want to take a stream of bits and convert them into objects that need to go somewhere. Just write it one time and just keep reusing that. Okay, so, um, are we out of time? Excellent. So the second half of this, if you're staying, and if you're not, I'm going to entice you, or maybe not. The second half, we have robots. I'll tell you more about this group when we start the second half, but that's our junior engineering group. They made you robots to hack on and to communicate to. None of you seem excited. <laughs> that is really weird to me. So our second half, we're going to do a variety of different things, um, including the meta game in which you have to try to send your registration for winning one of these to the server using the networking TS. Good luck. All right, see you after break.